become 13. When we first met, I asked her, what do you want to study? She said, algae. Algae uh, in outer space. <laughs> well, this is a marine species. <laughs> <laughs> Or algae in the water also. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not an expert in algae. Okay. He said, well, he wants to look at a large scale. And so perhaps he can use the most sensitive tool to study algae. So that's great. Okay, then we find you a topic to consult with. Uh, so luckily, so not very long after she came here, uh, there was a, an airborne photo from a advance in the southwest uh, coast of Hawaii, taken by a big Lisa <coughs> Robin. Okay. She was flying over. So it's a white thing in our office. And she jumped on that. So I like that. <laughs> so interesting. And I said, well, it may be, there may be algae in it. So we can study this. Okay. Uh, that's how she found this topic of this uh, uh, white thing phenomena of South Florida and also of Cuba. And that's what her thesis was about. Okay. And uh, on her committee, we have all four major disciplines. Okay. Representatives, Bob Byrne, John Paul, Lisa Robin, and myself. Okay. And if you read the thesis, this is a truly interdisciplinary thesis. It covers all aspects of marine science from chemistry, biology, geology, physics, optics, or it's, it's really wonderful. And uh, before she came here, um, Jackie had a degree from Florida State University in physical science, but she know pretty little about marine science. And, but in the course of two years, uh, she learned so much in so many labs and uh, you know, with a goal of explaining this phenomenon. And whatever she needed to learn or she needed to do, she, she just jumped on it. If a boat is leaking water, she would drive to Home Depot buy a car to fix the boat. <laughs> <laughs> so in John Paul's world, she's a fearless. She, she's a fearless. And so in three years, she defended and moved on. Now she's working at uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in a marine biogeochemistry lab. And just last month, she was on board of a cruise to sample biogeochemistry, uh, water biogeochemistry in North Pacific. And uh, Kirsten Bach's student was also on board. So they stayed there for a month. Um, so she had a lot of experience in field work, and she's well trained. And uh, <coughs> she continued her original motivation in studying marine algae. Uh, now, uh, she's back, and let's uh, give her give give her a, a big hand and let's. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Wow, what a lovely introduction! Thank you all for coming. I see so many familiar faces. This is really exciting to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work I just started with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, I just started that position in summer. And first, I'll be giving a little bit of a review of what I did here at the University of South Florida. Um, that really gave me the foundation to start this new career. So starting off with part one, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on whitings, what whitings are, and why we care about them. A lot of people haven't heard of a whiting event. Uh, for example, this is an aerial photograph of a whiting feature in the water. It's literally just water that looks whiter in color than outside waters. And that whiter color is due to a higher level of calcium carbonate, um, which is basically what your bones are made out of. But when we're talking about things like this in the marine system, there are very tiny particles of calcium carbonate. In other words, particulate inorganic carbon, or PIC. So we know how to define a whiting feature. And um, just to backtrack a little bit, they're not formed by coccolithophores, which are a known calcareous algae. Uh, they're kind of this unknown mystery event. We don't understand how they form. But there's two main branches uh, of theories that explain how they precipitate in the waters. There's the inorganic side and the organic side of the debate, or in other words, a biologically mediated debate on precipitations. 
So on the inorganic side, you start with super saturated waters. There's a bunch of calcium ions and carbonate or bicarbonate floating around the water, but they don't have anything to precipitate onto. So for any nucleation event, like clouds, you need dust particles for precipitation to occur. In the water, same thing. So in this case, you have some kind of resuspension event of that bottom sediment, uh, maybe by like bottom feeding fish, and that sediment acts as that nucleation point for calcium carbonate to grow off of. And um, the inorganic theory says that this is what produces a weighing event. The organic theory is based on cellular metabolic processes of uh, phytoplankton, for example, whereby through photosynthesis, they change the water chemistry and create kind of this alkaline microenvironment outside of the cell. And then there's a hydrogen pumping gradient where you end up with a high level of calcium ions outside of the cell, all of which is conducive to calcium um, carbonate formation. And then you add in the fact that the cell is act actually acting as that nucleation site in, let's say, like a bloom. So if you have a bloom where this is occurring, you have a lot of cells, um, you're creating a lot of this microalkaline environment, then you can form a whitening this way. And this organic theory hypothesis was really led by Lisa Robbins at USGS um, and Patricia Blackwelder and Kim Yates. And they saw from whitening samples taken in the Bahamas, uh, this is a transmission electron microscope image and a scanning electron microscope image, they found that synecococcus cells, which were highly abundant in the whiting waters, were often associated with this calcium carbonate, um, and here's kind of like a fluffier uh, amorphous calcium carbonate structure attached to the cells. So it's important to understand why whiting events occur or what's forming them, because if it's inorganic or organic, it can mean it's either a source or a sink of carbon, or maybe it's just neutral. Um, and also it's important because it's a global phenomenon. So these events happen in lake systems like Lake Ontario and uh, Lake Michigan, and also in semi-enclosed systems like the Persian Gulf. And again, these aren't coccolithophore blooms, this is just a whitening event, be unknown. Um, and also in lake systems, they can take up almost the entire lake like you see here, and they have kind of a diffuse look to them. And then in the marine system, which is where we were studying them, uh, we found them in the Gulf of Batabano in Cuba, and they have kind of this very patchy look to them. They have a really well-defined shape. And in the Bahamas, where they've been studied for almost a century, again, they have a very patchy shape, and it's really well-defined. So going to step away from whiting specifically right now so that we can get some background on the biological carbon pump and why, again, we should even care about whiting events or particulate and organic carbon at all. So you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it goes into the water. What happens to that carbon afterwards? It can end up in a lot of different carbon pools, as we call it. So for example, it could end up as particulate organic carbon, like uh, phytoplankton, which are actually eating up that carbon dioxide and forming their organic um, matter from it. Or you could have particulate inorganic carbon, in which case you're actually emitting a little bit of carbon dioxide into the ocean system. And then you have uh, ecological effects like grazers come in, they mess up the whole system, eat that particulate organic carbon, and it becomes dissolved organic carbon. Now, and right now we're kind of just talking about surface water systems, nothing's sinking out. We can talk about fish poop, that would sink. Um, but another way that particulate inorganic carbon is important is it can attach to the organic carbon and through something called ballasting, which is a fancy way for saying you're making it heavier, it'll sink out to um, ocean depths where it might stay for, let's say, months to millennia at a time. So point being, PIC is an important piece in understanding this global carbon exchange. Keep that in your back pocket for now. Back to whitening events. Um, my project really started when Lisa Robbins, again at USGS, uh, was flying from Tampa to the Florida Keys and took these aerial photographs from out of her plane. And she did a lot of research on whitenings in the Bahamas, um, so she's very familiar with what they look like, and she thought, that's really odd. We haven't really documented whitings in these areas before. Let's see what's happening. So she sent this upper right image to my advisor, Shwam Minhu. Uh, he tasked me to find it in same day satellite imagery, which that image, it's a MODIS image showed on the left. And zooming in, you can see that it's the same feature. It was roughly in the same uh, GPS coordinates that Lisa gave me. So we looked at the days prior and the days after to see if it persisted over time. And sure enough, that feature lasted for nearly two months. Um, 
And over that time, it changed shape a little bit. So for example, this is it the day prior, and it moved around a tiny bit. But for the most part, it just stayed in this like a nice defined shape. It didn't diffuse out, um, which is one way that you can tell it apart from resuspended sediment, which has kind of like this diffuse outer border. And it also will settle after like maybe a day or two unless you have uh, a sustained storm system, in which case you wouldn't even see whiting because this whole shelf bank would just be blasted. It would be super white. Um, so that's one important key thing in differentiating whiting from sediment resuspension. So that got us interested enough to do a spatiotemporal analysis, do some kind of long-term study to see, uh, first, is this feature recurrent? Was this a one-time event? And if so, does it happen more frequently in some years than other years? And is there a seasonal trend to it? Because in the Bahamas, we know that whiting events more frequently happen in the spring and the fall, for example. So I use that same satellite, MODIS, because it has pretty good resolution. You can see a lot of these whiting features in it. Um, and it also has a daily repeat cycle, which is great for studying something like this. And also, it takes two images a day. So if you're fighting cloud cover, if you want to get good data, that gives you a statistical advantage. So over those 13 years, that meant that I looked through over 9,000 images in southwest Florida and basically looked for tiny patches of white water. And then I spent a lot of my masters trying to find a method to automatically delineate whiting features to kind of say, OK, do they have a specific spectral shape to them? Can you use remote sensing reflectance to almost like fingerprint a whiting pixel? And long story short, it's really difficult when you're in a shallow water system. So I manually delineated every single whiting feature that we found. Um, and then put them into a program that Meng Shu Wang here created, which uh, spits out these really lovely graphs of mean whiting frequency. So here we're looking at the 13-year time series starting in 2003 um, and going to 2015. And warmer colors would be, those pixels would be where whiting events during that year were more frequent, um, cooler colors less frequent, and then this gray uh, kind of brownish color would be when they occurred not at all in that year. Um, so you can see that there is some kind of seasonal or annual trend where after 2005, whiting event uh, mean whiting frequency increased and peaked in 2011 and 2012, and thereafter started to decrease again. Um, spatially, during these years of high whiting, uh, mean whiting frequency, the whiting events were more constrained near shore, which is an interesting effect. And then if we're looking at the seasonal coverage, so every bar is color coordinated to the seasons, where winter is blue, spring is green, summer is orange, autumn is kind of a peachy color, uh, you can see that during those years of low annual whiting frequency, um, 2003 to 2009, they, the season of maximum whiting coverage was during winter, which actually matches the seasonality in Cuba. And then following that, on, from 2009 onward, the seasonality shifted. And these are also the years when whiting was more frequent um, to spring and autumn, which matches the seasonality in the Bahamas. And then looking at the distribution, so each of these shows uh, the full 13, the mean of the full 13-year time series for each season. And during winter and fall, for example, whiting events were more often found offshore. So now we want to find out, okay, that's interesting, but why? Like, what's happening in the water, right? So to do that, we took, uh, and I'll back up one second. So that's an easy thing to say. To do this, uh, we basically, or I had to look at a satellite image every single day and see if there was a whiting event, um, what's the wind state for the next two days? Because that meant that I saw it at 8 p.m. So the next day I would pack up everything, all the gear for the boat, and then we trailer it down to the Everglades, which is kind of a hike in itself. And then once we got there, we would spend the night and then wake up early the next morning and then finally go sample. So that means that in Southwest Florida, hopefully it didn't rain and hopefully the wind was calm enough to take a 13 foot boat out. Um, so I won't say that we had failed attempts a, a few times, but we definitely got a lot of data on what non-whiting water looked like prior to that. <laughs> so there were a few of those. So we got a good baseline for what the water state was like in um, this part of the Everglades. But we got lucky once, and we were able to sample within a whiting feature and outside. And in the field, it was really cool to see firsthand because you can really see that line of delineation from that bright white water to outside, even in just like a small boat. Um, we took a suite of parameters, 
Some were optical, so we took backscattering just to make sure that we were in this high turbid water. Uh, we took in situ remote, uh, remote sensing reflectance um, to match up with satellite data. The chemical analyses we did was focused on studying the carbonate state, state of the water. Um, we took surface sediment to do grain size fractionation and also composition. And then um, the biological samples we took were one to make sure maybe this is a coccolithic pore bloom or not. So they're specific for coccolithic pores. It wasn't. Um, and then two, general phytoplankton taxonomy and abundance. And then also for um, scanning electron microscopy analysis. So I'm not going to go through all of these because maybe some of you were at my thesis defense and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I will focus on the biological. Um, so to do this, again, using a scanning electron microscope, which is basically like using a really high powered laser to shoot at your sample and you get a really fine resolution, which is awesome. Way better than you can do with just like an optical microscope. And what we saw when I looked at uh, the whiting water sample that was filtered, and this matched up with um, the abundance of phytoplankton that we did, was this very small, it's about three microns in diameter, specific species of Thalassia sierra diatom. So again, diatoms are silicious beings. They don't really have any interest in calcium carbonate. They make their frustules out of silica. And this is diatom rich water. So there's plenty of other diatoms around. And for example, all their diatoms looked really clean like this. There was no attachment to them. So at this point, we can't say for sure, like, I mean, it definitely looks like mineral, but is it calcium carbonate? But luckily, there's this cool attachment that you can put on the SEM called uh, X-ray dispersive spectrometer, and it spits out um, your elemental composition. So we were able to confirm that, yeah, this is some kind of calcite or aragonite growth. Um, it's definitely playing a part in this whitening formation, uh, but we can't exactly say how at this point. So to sum up those conclusions from this study, we found that these are recurring features in Southwest Florida. There's an interannual trend where in 2011 and 2012 they peaked. There's intraannual trends of season seasonal fluctuations and there's a lot of different uh, spatial distributions. They're not always regulated near shore, um, but sometimes it occurs more frequently near shore like during years of high uh, whitening frequency. And then from direct sampling, we found um, that, yes, the waters were higher in backscattering, so that lines up with the theory that whitening water is high turbid water with calcium carbonate. Um, the remote sensing reflectance that we found, so the blue lines indicate waters that were uh, sampled within the whitening event, whereas the red is outside waters, um, matched up really well with previous work done in the Bahamas of in situ remote sensing reflectance where basically the same shape is seen in whitening waters as outside waters, but it's all elevated, which is what you would expect if something's just whiter in color. All the colors would be a higher reflectance. And then chemically, we found that there were differences in the carbonate state. Um, for example, uh, PCO2, the first two dots in these graphs are from within whitening waters. The third one is at the edge, and then the last one is in outside waters. Um, Sadly, there wasn't enough data to do a solid statistical analysis of this, but we do see that there's some kind of difference between them. And then the most striking thing that we found was the biological result um, of this novel association between diatoms and whiting particulate, which previously it was thought it was only that had this association. Um, and that's also novel to diatom studies because, like I said, they really don't have any, any interest in calcium carbonate. Um, and then recently, there was a highlight by NASA Earth Observatory on this study, if you want to see just a really brief review of it. Uh, but overall, this is what really got me interested in studying the different carbon pools and going into carbonate sciences and how we could use remote sensing to better study our ocean and all. And it gave me a lot of the tools to head to where I live now, over here at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and start the project, um, that the projects that I've been working on with this fantastic woman, Dr. Andrea Fossbender, uh, she just started the Marine Biogeochemical Laboratory at Embari about a year and a half ago. And then I just started this past summer, and I'm her first employee, so we have a lot going on. She has tons of projects going on, and everything's kind of in like this gearing up state. Uh, but for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on um, her NSF 
project, which is focused on carbon export. So going on to part two. The biological pump, what we don't know and why we should care. So going back to biopump. Um, on the left, this is just showing how carbon is sequestered through those different pools with depth. And the main takeaway from this is that those biological contributors, the POC and the PIC, are 90%. So another way to think of this is if you sped up the um, biological carbon pump or slowed it down, it's hypothesized that this is the difference between an ice age and a warming period. It has a huge effect. If these weren't contributing, you would just have about 10% of um, it due to gas exchange from the air-sea interface. Not a lot would be, a lot of carbon would be sequestered. It would be a very dull system overall. But So right now, uh, if we're talking about carbon exchange, let's say that the amount of carbon entering the water is the same as that going out, we would be in a steady state. And overall, this is kind of assumed to be where we're at. I know a lot of you are probably like, oh, but there's places that our carbon sinks, and there's places of upwelling where carbon gets resuspended. Um, but overall, if you're taking an average globally, it's assumed that we're at the steady state. If you had an enhanced biological carbon pump, you would be pumping more carbon at, into depth. For example, if you had the reverse, a reduced biological pump, you would end up with kind of this reservoir of carbon at the surface. And with increases in anthropogenic CO2, uh, there's definitely some perturbation happening to the biological carbon pump. The issue is we don't know what, because we don't have a really good method of measuring this. Um, there's a lot of algorithms to get at uh, what's called expert production, or in other words, kind of carbon sequestration is how you can think of it. Um, so to get to that, you calculate it from uh, primary production and then something called the E-ratio, which is just export production over primary production. You get export production. So Pileski um, et al. at 2017 did this study to basically show how different your results can be based on what input values you use. So for example, uh, here primary production was calculated using a different algorithm than this one. Here the E-ratio was calculated using a different algorithm than this one. And then you can see how different the, export, the result is in export production. Uh, these graphs should look somewhat the same. They look super different. So currently, global estimates span a range of about 100%. That's pretty poor. Um, a big reason for that is because these algorithms are built off of uh, regionally focused areas. So a lot of in situ measurements may be taken in specific areas, and I think anyone will agree that's a poor thing to expand globally. Um, another big issue is that particulate and organic carbon in these algorithms is completely left out. And as we saw, it could be a huge contributor in carbon export. Um, a lot, mostly they rely on particulate organic carbon, or they make some kind of calculation for dissolved organic carbon, but PIC is not part of the picture. So point being, we really don't know what's happening to the rate of the biological pump, and we first need to establish a really good baseline, which is where our NSF project comes into play, and we also need to differentiate these distinct carbon pools to get a better uh, algorithm of explaining um, export production. So that brings us into the next part of part two, constraining unknowns using bio-argo flows, which is what our NS pro NSF project is all about. Um, the ultimate goal of this would be to have a total global array of these bio-argo floats so that we can get a better global model of export production. And we started with these two floats named Nemo and Dory because we'll always be looking for them, basically. Um, and they're special because Unlike a lot of Argo floats, they're bio-Argo floats, so they have the, the suite of MCOM sensors, which are bio-optical sensors, um, that puts the bio and bio-Argo. And then these ones also have a pH sensor, which is very unusual for Argo floats. There's a lot of SOCOM Argo floats in the Southern Ocean that have this, but otherwise you don't find it often. And with that, we'll be able to use the in-situ pH data and then an estimated value of total alkalinity from in-situ data and calculate DIC, dissolved in organic carbon, and actually be able to differentiate those different carbon pools. Um, so that's a very novel thing. And quick review, if no one's familiar with Argo floats, they basically sink down to about 2,000 meters and come back up, and on their way back up, 
they take all their measurements. So you get a really nice vertical profile of measurements from these floats. It has about a 10-day repeat cycle, and they can last for up to five years, which is awesome. So the first step was finding out, figuring out where we should put Nemo and Dory. Uh, we decided on Ocean Station Papa for a lot of different reasons. It's a historical site with tons of data already readily available. Um, it has over 10 years of existing mooring and float data. Um, it's a large PIC concentration area, which is something that we're interested in. Um, and it has, it's boring, which is great if, if you're... <laughs> <laughs> Not physics is boring, boring physics. Different. Um, yeah, so if you're testing an algorithm for the first time, you want a boring area. <laughs> All right, so on to our first test. Another reason we chose Ocean Station Papa is because there's this giant campaign called Exports, which is mostly NASA people and then a few NSF people like our lab joined onto it. Um, and their first field study was going to be at Ocean Station Papa, so perfect. This whole campaign is also focused on carbon export, but more looking at the mechanisms of carbon export. Um, it was a huge campaign. There were two ships involved, a bunch of different floats, uh, and it was in that area of the North Pacific for 34 days. And during that time, I really realized how lucky I was to do field work in Florida, because it is cloudy the entire time. The sea state is terrible, and it's rainy and cold. <laughs> but we got really good data, so it's fine. Um, this map's just to show how much was going on. So every alphanumeric word uh, basically shows a different float or um, boat. Uh, there are wave gliders out there and Lagrangian floats. Basically, all of a sudden, Ocean Station Papa was like a big party if you're a marine robot in August. Uh, this shows all of the stations that we completed. We did 144 CTD casts, and that doesn't include all the thorium pumping we did. There were um, tons of optics casts and other gliders deployed off of it. And then there was a whole second boat doing all this other crazy stuff. Uh, so this was just on the RV Sally ride. This was our schedule. It was 24 hours, which if you were by yourself like I was, the most logistical issue with this schedule was just figuring out how to sleep the entire time. And then here's the sensors that um, I brought on board. So we took uh, discrete measurements of pH, and we measured them spectrophotometrically. Thanks, Bob Burns Lab, for figuring that one out. Um, and the system was put together in-house by Yui Takashita's lab at Ambari. We had a nitrate sensor on the rosette, so we got nitrate profiles during every CTD cast. And we also had an underway pH and nitrate sensor, um, so we were getting great surface data the whole time. And all of this uh, was mostly so that we could calibrate those two bio-argo floats that we were putting out into the water. Um, so we're in the quality control phase right now, so these profiles, these, we did over 100 nitrate profiles. I know they look shifted. They're probably going to be all overlapping. Like I said, it's a very boring area. This is almost 144 lines, and they'll all go over each other almost exactly. <laughs> Way different than the Gulf. And then here's the discrete pH samples. I ran over 500 of those. Um, and before quality controlling, we're pretty happy with them. They all line up really well. And then behind this, we even have uh, our float data lining up really well with it, shown in red and black. And then the one major hiccup we had was towards the tail end of it, Nemo had an upset bladder, so we ended up having to recover him, which we got super lucky. These floats are not meant to be recovered, but we were able to find it, go out, get Nemo back, and he'll be redeployed next month. But in the meantime, we got data from him for almost the entire crew, so that was awesome. So, so lucky. Um, here's just showing one of the floats, uh, Dory, her whole journey since we deployed her. Um, and here's Ocean Station Papa. So hopefully they'll both stay near Ocean Station Papa and we'll get a lot of good mooring and float data from there. And they're already giving us great um, profiles. So this is when she was on a three-day repeat cycle, but now they'll be put on 10-day repeat cycles. Uh, we also collected, um, or I collected 100, over 100 samples for DIC and TA, which will be ran back at the lab soon and more than 700 hours of pH and nitrate surface data that um, Yui Takashida gets to look at over the next month. So now we're just focused on spreading that data and working with all the other lead investigators with, through exports and NSF. And this just shows the lead investigators. There's almost 50 scientists involved, or over 50 scientists involved in this project, including Kristen Buck in her lab, 
Um, two of her students were actually out there, but they were on the other boat, so I didn't see them the whole time. <laughs> and then the next step, after we get to finally test our algorithm, now that we're getting all this in situ data, would be to do it somewhere a little bit more complex uh, and try to join in with Export's next field mission, which is in the North Atlantic in 2020. Um, and then again, the ultimate vision is kind of this global takeover of bio Argo floats with pH sensors on them so that we can get a better global array. And this isn't gonna be a just our lab thing. It's gonna be um, a lot of contributions from a lot of different labs doing this. And then finally, uh, where I'm gonna bring in my expertise on this project, since it won't usually be going out to the field a lot and doing what I have been doing, um, I'll be able to start doing remote sensing again, which I'm really excited about, and uh, helping build these particulate and organic carbon algorithms that already exist and using the data and algorithms that we're building to better the satellite algorithms, as well as net community production algorithms and net primary production algorithms. And I'd like to say thank you to Mrs. Ann Sackett. Of course, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the award. Um, all of my uh, committee members at CMS, and then Adam Bari, Dr. Andrea Fassbender, my boss, uh, Dr. Yui Tashida, who we work very closely with, his research tech, Joe Warren, and um, the Ken Johnson lab with Luke Coletti and Carol Sakamoto. Oh, right. <laughs> is, is that going to be challenging for you with the cloud cover that exists in the Northwest? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. But that's kind of why we're they're focusing on the northern uh, polar regions, because there hasn't been a lot done. It's really difficult. So you're hoping just to get maybe one cloud-free image a day. Um, but it's better than nothing. You know, it's the best we can do, and uh, it's definitely novel and exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. And then same in the North Atlantic. Again, 